Good morning. This is Disha Bakchi for the print, and we are back with Lieutenant General H. S. Panag to discuss his column from this week. U.S. General Mark Milley showed how military stays loyal to Constitution under government control. Welcome back, General. Thank you for being here. Uh, Disha, as I always say, it's a pleasure to discuss my column with you every week. So, in this week's column, you look at. U.S. Army General Mark Alexander Miley's illustrious yet controversial career, as you say, especially focusing on his role under the Trump administration. So, to begin with, why was the relationship between the military, the civil government, and the Constitution under threat in the U.S. during the Trump administration? See, Mr. Trump, uh, as the president of United States. Uh, was from the Republican Party, and Republican Party, as we are aware, is a right of center uh, party. Uh, but within the Republican Party, uh, President Trump had rather extreme right wing views. He wanted personal loyalty from his generals, both. Uh, who are serving, and even those whom he had kept in his cabinet. Uh, all are aware that at one time he had four retired army commander equivalent uh, and above equivalent uh, uh, military officers, former military officers in his cabinet, you know, as the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, uh, the National Security Advisor and also his own chief of staff. So he wanted unquestioned loyalty. In fact, he's on record to tell his uh, chief of staff that uh, the American generals should be like the German generals were under Hitler. And uh, they gave him unquestioned loyalty and obedience. In fact, uh, quite surprised, uh, his chief of staff replied that uh, they also attempted to assassinate Hitler twice. But uh, it, it present se uh, seems to have uh, missed the point. So he wanted unquestioned loyalty, whereas loyalty of the military is to the Constitution. And uh, it is, uh, and it's accountable to the elected president and the legislature. That's, uh, uh, that makes the laws. Uh, but its loyalty remains to the constitution. So this was the reason, this was the primary reason. The second reason was that like all dictators, uh, President Trump was also very fond of spectacles. Uh, while there are certain mandatory military parades and functions held in the United States, but he had been to, you know, the uh, French celebrations of the Bastille Day, and he was very impressed by the Grand Parade, and he came and told his staff that I also want a Grand Parade like that. Uh, in fact, the officiating uh, um, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff told him that he uh, was born in Portugal, uh, where uh, such spectacles were quite common, but Portugal was then ruled by a dictator. Uh, again, Trump missed the point, and he insisted uh, on, um, uh, on on having uh, uh, having having a grand military parade. Uh, the military pointed out the cost, etc. But still, Trump had his way, and he did have a parade uh, about two years after this. It happened in two zero one eight, and this was this parade was held after nearly two years after that. So, uh, and then lastly. He was very keen to quickly use uh, the military to quell internal security problems. Like in the case of the uh, Black Lives Matter protests, he was very keen to deploy active troops. Whereas United States active troops are very rarely deployed. And it's the National Guards, uh, which, have, which are under the respective states and which have both uh, state as well as federal responsibilities, uh, they are normally used. So he wanted to uh, very quickly, uh, quickly uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, use the active troops so that uh, 
everything was cleaned up particularly in in the case of uh, uh, the capital city washington dc and uh, lastly he also had a panache for disregarding military advice when the military gave him advice uh, as far as uh, how to how to handle uh, north korea since he's got a uh, they've got nuclear weapons so he made some very very sort of uh, off the cuff and very derogatory remarks uh, um, you know both against uh, the, the north korean government as well as uh, to its uh, his own own uh, advising uh, generals so these were the reasons as to why this relationship uh, uh, between the constitution um, military and the president was uh, uh, under strain during the uh, years of his presidency right so in your column you also talk about the politicization of the military so what are some of the dangers of such a phenomenon actually uh, there are two aspects one is uh, a political exploitation of the military by the political governments and second is politicization uh, both tend to be used interchangeably but there is a subtle difference uh, and the subtle difference is that uh, in the first case uh, in uh, political exploitation uh, the political government since the army enjoys uh, public support and enjoys public adulation it enjoys public confidence uh, it's the most loved institution of of of, of any nation Uh, so the government want, seeks to identify itself with it, and uh, there is no harm. All governments try it, and all governments have done it in the past. But if uh, the if there is a infringement of constitution or if there is the infringement of uh, the political ideology while doing so, then the military has to protest. And if it does not protest, that means it succumbs uh, to the political, uh, you know, the designs. Uh, politicization of the army as such means that the army is now uh, has got a political ideology or it has identified with a particular political ideology and it starts becoming a player uh, in the in the in in uh, in uh, national uh, national politics um, its advice um, uh, ceases to be rational it tends to suit uh, Uh, the ideology it prefers or the ideology of the political party it uh, tends to tends to support so its advice gets colored it gets wrong advice does not give rational advice and invariably it also leads nations towards uh, towards situations uh, uh, of uh, of conflict uh, probably the two examples of really politicized armies are pakistan where it began by the with political exploitation of the military by the civilian governments in the early 50s and uh, then the military started controlling the civilian governments and finally it usurped power that's the extreme form of uh, extreme form of politicization once you the army gets totally politicized in the end it says that why shouldn't we get the power when we are if they are manipulating us then why shouldn't we manipulate the entire system uh, and the other politicized army in a different form is probably uh, the the people's liberation army which is a part of and parcel of the party but that generally happens under the under the communist it was so in the erstwhile ussr also or, and probably the runt of other communist countries like north africa and probably to some extent cuba uh, where the army is part and parcel of the of the of of the uh, communist party and it does nothing differently it it thinks like that it talks like that now what what is happening say in india is has so far been primarily political exploitation but as i said these terms tend to get used interchangeably uh, extreme form of political exploitation changes to politicization for example uh the present government had used the military for holding spectacles during covid for covid warriors to celebrate uh, uh, the end of uh, covid and so on and it has used uh, 
number of air shows while for the opening of roads under the pretext of uh, trial landings, whereas the full proper air shows have been held. Recently, there was an air show held in Bhopal, uh, where, which uh, the state which is going to uh, uh, elections uh, shortly. But why in Bhopal? Why not elsewhere? Bhopal doesn't even have a proper military uh, air base there. And it was just held. So one is, uh, so in the extreme form, uh, the military is either due to weakness of the hierarchy, its character, or lack of spine, it tends to get get sucked into politics. Another example is when we discussed the other, other uh, column of ours, that uh, the soldiers have been asked to go on leave and uh, propagate the, the central government uh, welfare schemes, knowing fully well that some of them are in contradiction with the state government uh, schemes. And it's a sure way of the, the soldiers will get sucked into local uh, local politics. So this is, these are the dangers of uh, politicization. It is best for a democratic country that the military should adhere to the constitution and its role as per constitution is clearly defined. It must not do the uh, biddings of, uh, of any political party in power. In a democracy, political parties come and go. You cannot start changing uh, changing, changing track every time the, the government changes. And sometimes the government changed very fast as it happened with us in, 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 in the 1990s. Uh, we had uh, in the course of in the entire 90s, we had uh, 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 four governments, uh, you know, rather, uh, yeah, four governments uh, uh, in power at, 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 the, at the center. So these are the dangers of politicization and uh, democracies must always guard against it. Right. So now looking at uh, General Miley and his career, you discuss his actions during uh, the time when the U.S. was facing the Black Lives Matter protests. And uh, could you talk about what the impact of his actions during these protests were? Yeah, uh, I think this was a, um, a sort of a benchmark for uh, General Miley. And it was also what made him change his uh, uh, approach uh, towards uh, how to, um, you know, uh, deal with the uh, President uh, Trump. Uh, you are aware that there were Black Lives Matter protests that started after the alleged killing of, uh, 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 you know, person of uh, uh, African origin by uh, by policemen, and they had spread all over the country. There were large scale riots, and then finally uh, on first of June, two zero one. Uh, 2020 yeah i think uh, they reached uh, they reached uh, 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 washington dc and uh, the protests were very close to the white house uh, the president was visibly angry there was no reason for him to be so because riots can always be controlled after all we have had riots at at uh, uh, as close to india gate and every day protests are held at uh, jantar mantar uh, you are well aware of that uh, but he was very angry and he told, uh, he in fact uh, shouted at, uh, he first wanted General Miley to deploy active troops. Now, active troops as distinct from the National Guards are, are the ones which are, which are field formations, uh, you know, which we also deploy at the drop of a hat, which is also, I, in my view, is wrong because we've got enough central paramilitary forces. But uh, uh, so the president told General Miley that you... Uh, should deploy active troops and quickly get these people out of Washington, D.C. Uh, General uh, Miley protested and said that um, uh, there's no requirement of active troops and uh, the National Guards are enough. And in the District of Columbia, uh, which Washington, D.C. is uh, part of, uh, uh, the uh, National Guards are also under, the, under, under, uh, under, under federal control. Uh, but Trump shouted at him, called him a loser, and uh, used uh, profanity. Uh, this uh, really shocked uh, General, General Miley, but he stood his ground. Then, uh, while all this was going on, uh, it, uh, Trump uh, told him, as a, also his uh, Secretary of uh, Defense, who in any case uh, is a retired, was a retired soldier and, and a politician by now, uh, that... Uh, Let's go. And they started walking out of the White House 
uh, across the Lafayette Lafayette Square and onto the St. John's Church uh, across the square, uh, and uh, which had been damaged by the protesters, but the protesters had been cleared by the National Guards. So he went there for a photo shoot uh, to show uh, that um, basically solidarity with the right wing. That here are, you know, Black Lives Matter protesters destroying the church, and here's the president standing by, you know, uh, by the church and promising to rebuild it or whatever. So now Miley didn't know this was going to happen. So he became, he by default, he became part of this entourage that was going towards uh, St. John's Church. He realized it a little too late that it's a political event. So he tried to slink away. Uh, 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 sort of, uh, uh, he did, in fact, he did, he did walk away with unnoticed and uh, um, but came under severe criticism from the veteran uh, community. And uh, uh, he was in personally in a state of uh, shock. Um, he was publicly criticized by, uh, by the opposition, by the Democrats. Uh, by, uh, there were murmurs within uh, the service. So he decided uh, first to submit his resignation. And he thought of, um, you know, a couple of counts, uh, a notable among them was uh, criticization of the military, uh, using the military to create uh, fear, uh, discrimination against uh, um, uh, minorities, and disturbing the international order. We'll be more about it later. So on these counts, he first thought he will tender his resignation, but then uh, he decided that there was no point in tendering resignation. He must stand up and fight from within. So this incident happened on 1st, on 10th of June, uh, while the uh, new course was commencing at the National Defense University, um, Miley publicly apologized. And he said that um, uh, I shouldn't have been there. It was a political event. And my presence uh, was contrary to the military traditions, et cetera, et cetera. That's a paragraph worth of, uh, worth of uh, statement uh, that he gave. And uh, he redeemed himself. And from that day onwards, uh, that's middle of uh, uh, 2020, he also uh, decided that now the time had come to take his fellow chiefs into confidence for any further, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, measures the military must take to uphold the uh, constitution in future. Right. So... Since you mentioned how uh, after these event, after these particular events, General Miley kind of brought his uh, counterparts in uh, confidence, you also talk about how he took certain measures which can be seen co as controversial to, to ensure the integrity of the military, uh, especially during the Trump ad administration's uh, last few months where Trump was also was also going to challenge the 2020 electoral results. So could you talk a little bit about what these actions were, why they were considered controversial? Actually, what uh, what uh, alarmed uh, uh, General Miley was that even before the elections, uh, President Trump had started saying, and I have given a quote there, uh, that uh, uh, the elections are likely to be rigged. So uh, Miley felt that uh, there are chances that uh, the president may not accept the electoral, electoral verdict. So he drew up a plan and took his fellow uh, members of the chief of staff committee into confidence, which basically was that we must prevent uh, uh, the president from starting an unnecessary war to prolong his presidency. And second was that uh, the military must not be used against the people of the United States or in any manner to maintain a President Trump in power against the electoral verdict. So this was a, a kind of uh, a collective uh, decision was uh, decision was uh, taken. Now, as the uh, uh, you know, as the election day came closer, um, election, I think the results were obvious on the 3rd of uh, November, 
But uh, prior to that, there were rumors uh, that uh, in, in China that uh, the president might start a war with China uh, because based upon the kind of rumors that were floating around within the United States itself. So uh, uh, Miley took an unprecedented decision of speaking to his Chinese counterpart. Uh, so he spoke to the Chinese counterpart and assured him that uh, there is going to be no sudden attack on, uh, on, 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 on People's Republic of China and he should have no fear on this accord. And like in you know, all these things, there's a, there's a build up before any, anything happens. And he did that on, on, uh, on uh, 30th of uh, uh, October. And I think he did that again um, after the um, uh, after the election uh, results uh, uh, once more. Uh, and he he later on even the uh, later on the the Senate uh, Defense Committee questioned him on this issue, and he said that this was well within his uh, charter to maintain stability with other armed forces, and he has done it uh, in the full knowledge of the Secretary of Defense. And uh, uh, he said 10 to 11 people were listening to the conversation that he had. Uh, so he was uh, well within his right to do so. And this was just to, uh, to, to prevent that any, any, any triggering uh, uh, accidental war, if not uh, by you, but as, uh, by, by the United States, but by the other party too. If it's so afraid, it may launch a preemptive, uh, uh, preemptive attack. In fact, not only to... Uh, the president of uh, to not only to his counterpart in China, he also spoke to the allies, that is NATO and uh, allies and others, their heads of their armed forces, on similar lines that uh, the uh, United States armed forces will maintain stability and there's no question of any kind of unnecessary uh, unnecessary uh, war. So this was then he uh, now uh, he didn't uh, stop at that as as the, it became evident that. Uh, uh, the president is going to, uh, you know, uh, sort of do something about uh, the electoral electoral verdict, and which actually happened on the sixth of sixth uh, yeah. of uh, um, uh, January, uh, you know, two zero two one. That is almost uh, fifteen days before uh, President Biden was to was to take over. So uh, at that time, uh, General Miley, uh, he. Um, made a, a sort of a, a statement to say, uh, I think it was on 10th of uh, January, that uh, uh, the United States military takes oath on the constitution. It does not take oath to any king, queen, or dictator. And, uh, and, and it's, it's, duty, it's duty bound to, to uh, uphold uh, the the, the constitution and it's the duty of every soldier, long kind of long winding, uh, little repetitive uh, kind of statement, thereby saying that the uh, United States military will not be part a party to the president in, in any form if he tries to um, go against uh, the, uh, the uh, electoral verdict, verdict as approved by the Congress. Now, once the electoral uh, verdict was uh, approved by the Congress, he further uh, emphasized on this issue uh, by saying that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, he, 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 he said that what happened on 6th of January uh, was unconstitutional. It was uh, something that shouldn't have uh, shouldn't have happened. And then he declared that uh, uh, on 20th of January, uh, President Joe Biden will take over as the you know, so-and-so president of the uh, United States uh, uh, as, as per the decision and approval of the electoral verdict by the, by the Congress, thereby uh, forestalling any other attempt by President Trump to, to take any measure in which he could have, uh, again, you know, gone against the electoral verdict. Right. So towards the end of your column, uh, you talk about the Indian Army and you talk about how the Indian Army has not studied the relationship between the between constitutional loyalty and civil control. 
So what is the importance of studying this relationship? Yeah, see, it is very important, particularly among senior officers, to understand what is the constitutional mandate of the armed forces. Uh, you are uh, aware that the constitutional mandate, as understood by everyone, is that uh, India, the armed forces will, you know, be so responsible for the uh, territorial uh, integrity of India and also assist the government uh, in natural calamities and also under a particular specific clause that uh, the government can, at its discretion, use them for uh, internally to uh, the armed forces to, uh, you know, quell disturbances uh, or protests. Uh, so this is this is this is what is generally enshrined in the constitution. But what uh, has uh, and you are aware also that the Indian Army. Uh, all soldiers, all officers take oath on the constitution, and uh, it's it is it's it's that oath right from the recruits to the commissioning of officers. This oath is uh, taken by all um, uh, personnel of the of the of the armed forces, and president is the supreme commander of the armed forces. The political authority, which we are aware in a democratic a parliamentary democracy, lies with the. Uh, with the prime minister and his cabinet. And of course, accountability is also to the legislature. Uh, so now the constitution is as such not taught in the army. It is not only what the army is, uh, army's charter, the officers, senior officers in particular, must know the constitution as a whole. What, what does the constitution mean? So it is not a formal subject in the Indian army. It's not, in there, not there in most armies. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, then as people become senior, when they start dealing with uh, the, the civil government directly, uh, and it comes at uh, for the staff officers from the levels of colonel upwards, uh, and but but more specifically, it's the generals that get to get it get to you know interact with the um, uh, civil military and uh, at the highest level then um, uh, uh, at the highest level. Uh, we have, uh, uh, of course, the the CDS, the three chiefs who take direct orders uh, from the political government. They must understand this relationship. What is the relationship? What are its nuances? What is right and what is wrong? Now, if you do not understand it, then you merely take this relationship of the political directions that you receive or perceive. In fact, uh, I have mentioned before that uh, very few written directions are ever given by, by by the government to the armed forces. Most of them are, are uh, you know, sort of uh, very brief, one or two liners, and which are given through the Ministry of Defense. And uh, the rest is the military's interpretation of it. So this, uh, these directions, are then the military, rather than evaluating them as to whether they... Uh, meet the stringent requirements uh, of the constitution as laid down in the, in, in by, by law. Uh, so they, instead of doing that, they tend to follow them as military orders. Okay, these are military orders. So we have received the orders that uh, a spectacle would be organized at so and so place because uh, the reason is because an election is about to be held. Uh, so the military just complies with it rather than giving the correct advice that uh, this is not the time to hold a spectacle there because there is the election which is likely and uh, this this will be seen as uh, a political action of, of the army. In fact, uh, General Malik, um, the chief of uh, army staff who was there during Kargil, he's on record that after Kargil war, when there were posters came up during the uh, elections, uh, you know, the parliamentary elections uh, about um, the photographs of the soldiers and uh, of uh, identifying them with the, the Bharati Ganta Party. He, um, uh, he spoke to the National Security Advisor, who was the, the principal, you know, uh, also uh, the insider uh, as far as uh, Prime Minister Bajpayee was concerned and pointed this out and those posters were, uh, were, were, take, were taken down. Uh, I mean, he spoke to, uh, I think, Mr. Brijesh Mishra, 
so these posters were taken down so they, there is something like that has happened but it doesn't seem to be uh, happening uh, happening now uh, same is the case with this uh, uh, issue of uh, um, soldiers carrying out uh, explaining and carrying forward the government uh, um, welfare schemes and during uh, while while on leave which is their legitimately their uh, their own time so point one that in absence of a proper understanding of the subject you tend to take civilian directions as order as military orders that they have to be obeyed that's a, that's what the military is used to but at that level you are supposed to now start making a distinction because there is you you have to also the protector of the constitution uh, and the second is second reason why it happens is a weak spine uh, if the hierarchy has a weak spine or it just tends to succumb it doesn't want to take a hard stand it probably uh, either is just lacking in moral courage or probably looking at some benefits for personal benefits post retirement or whatever or probably um, to, to become the cds uh, so currently uh, do i made a generic statement in my column that who betides the nation that suffers from both these maladies that is following government political directions as as military orders without relating them to the constitution and a weak spine so who betides the nation that suffers from both these maladies well uh, thank you general i think you brought up some very interesting insights firstly into an individual that not a lot of people might have been aware of uh, us army general miley but also talking about the nuanced relationship between the civil government the constitution and the military both in the case of the united states as well as in the context of india so for viewers interested in reading the full article by general panak the link to it is in the description below thank you and we will see you next week